Is that better? Okay. This is number five. Uh, make music to the Lord with the harp, for the harp, uh, with the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and blasts of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord. There we go. A lot of this talks about bursting into song and just one day we'll sing a new song of wonder for the wondrous things the Lord has done. Small things, four things here, here that I want to talk about a little bit tonight, and talk about why we're going to sing that new song. The first part is the wonders he's wrought. He's done marvelous things, the work of our salvation through Jesus Christ is a work of wonder. Viewing all the steps of it, from his uh, conceiving of it through the consummation of it, including its everlasting consequences when time is an end. We shall say God has done marvelous things. It's all his doing, and the more it is known, the more we'll admire it. The more we admire it, the more our new song changes. But just the marvelous things he's done, you know, some of them, if you think about it, uh, you know, you can look at Abraham, you can look at the children out of Egypt, you know, the, uh, you can look at Passover, where, you know, all the uh, firstborn were slaughtered in Egypt, all marvelous. You can look at the fact that David killed Goliath. How David was raised to be a king. Many marvels in the history of uh, Israel. And a lot of it in the Old Testament stems from those marvels. And it's even more marvelous that through all of that, he kept the lineage of Jesus exactly where it needed to be until the right time. Second thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the con uh, conquest he's won over the years. All the obstacles that have laid in the way of our redemption that Christ has overcome the suffering, the enemy that opposed him, 
be they man, Satan, or even death. No one helped him achieve the victory that was on his shoulders. And it had to be that way for victory to be a wondrous thing. The Father placed it on Jesus. And he had the choice of walking away from it or fulfilling it. That fulfillment meant that knowing he knew what was coming, he knew how bad it was going to be, and he took and steadied himself so that he was able to continue on. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was not praying to pass the cup. What he was praying for is, I don't want this, but you do. So we're going to go through with it. If there's any other way, you know, let's do it instead of what we've got to do. Satan and the temptations. Forty days in the wilderness. Forty nights. He's wore down. I mean, man doesn't survive for that period of time without food. It weakens the body. Jesus had to be weak. But he was strong in spirit. He was strong in what he needed to do. Satan came to him. Turn this rock into bread. He knew he could do it. Satan, there was no doubt in Satan's mind what he could do. Jesus stopped. And he told him, man doesn't live by bread alone. But for those things that came out of the Father's mouth. It's not just physical, it's spiritual. How many times do we forget the spiritual? We tend to feed ourselves physically quite a bit. Um, perfect example. Spiritual wise, we don't have the strength to uh, stand up to if we had the ability to turn that rock into bread after 40 days, could we withstand it? Or is it something special that Jesus was only able, only Jesus was able to do? The devil took him up to the tallest place on the temple. Told him, jump. The angels will stop you. They won't let your feet touch the ground. Was it testing God? Was it testing his command of the angels? What was the devil trying to do? Well, as Jesus could have done it and 10,000 angels would have responded immediately to protect him but it wouldn't have proved anything more than God's awesome power is more than mortal man can handle he responds differently you know do not test the Lord Then Satan takes him to a place. Don't know where this is. He can see all the kingdoms in the world. 
He's overlooking everything. Fall down and worship me and all this can be yours. He's sitting there telling this to that part of the Trinity to help create the whole thing. It's already his. He's not falling for it. Be gone. Talked a little bit about some of the Old Testament things. That's what the first part of of Psalms 98 is talking about. It's Old Testament stuff. It's talking about God's will, the wonders that He's done for His people. how things fit together. And the work of salvation and the work of redemption is truly remarkable. Could I have come up with it? No. He came up with it knowing there'd be problems along the way. He knew that the people, uh, the children of Israel, would worship idols. That their kings would become corrupt. He knew from the beginning that his creation would let him down. But all through it, he knew something that this is what we're going to do. Now, the revelation of his work of redemption, if you think about it, if he hadn't revealed it, he could have redeemed us not said anything about having to believe. We'll just let every you know, we'll redeem everybody, pay the price, everybody gets everybody's free. Something amazing that he provided. It's called free will. And that's that little thing that says, I can belong or I can walk away. I can do something that's right. I can do something that's wrong. It's not just for what God wants us to do. It's for our every day. I have the free will to make my life in any form that I can. If I want to rob banks, I can rob banks. That's not a, that is not a good idea because bank robbers live short lives. If I want to join the army and become a um, artillery spotter, um, I can't remember what the actual term actually is, but these guys are out there, and I believe their life expectancy is about nine seconds. And they start ringing that stuff down. Some of them make it a little longer, some of them a lot less. You have the choice to do that. But most importantly, we have the choice that when somebody tells us about Jesus and his salvation and his grace, we have the choice to believe and accept it, or we have the choice to turn away and say, we don't believe it. Take the, uh, you know, there's a Bible verse on the locker room that this, uh, you know, this particular um, place, 
in this school. We'd like it removed. But he gave them that choice. He gave them the choice to act in ways that are contrary to what we believe. He provided the choice to believe that uh, John Smith uh, was uh, his prophet or not. He gave us the choice to determine whether or not we follow Islam or Christianity. He's also given us some other choices. When he had his disciples with him and he was sending them all over the place, he gave them certain commands, go out into the world or I believe the proper terminology in the King James Version was to tell all creatures about the Lord. Tell, tell all creatures about our plan. It translates a lot better in the NIV as to all of creation. The Sometimes our translators, you know, they have that free will to make mistakes. Sometimes they make mistakes, and I like creatures, but boy, creation sounds so much better because everything he's ever touched. It's not, my dog doesn't need him because my dog doesn't understand. But boy, the other side of the world that at one time we didn't know existed, they needed it. Without the hand of God in all of this, we'd never know if salvation is redemptive work. This could have died out a little over 2,000 years ago. The truth, the way, the life, different names that was known by. What happened 2,000 years ago that kept it alive that kept to the point where in 1953 two or three this place was built this church was established in Martown what kept this church alive into the 2000s before we came God's hand what keeps this church alive now when we're few. God's hand because he has still some has something for us to do. Salvation and his redemptive work. It kind of needs to be told. Fourth point that I ran across was the accomplishment of prophecies and promises of the Old Testament. You see, in the middle of all this, in the Old Testament, God had made promises to his people. He'd made prophecies. His prophets had prophesied. They said, this will happen. The Messiah, you know, have a Messiah, He'll come. He'll be known by this name, this name. This is what he's going to do. He could have done it without all that. He could have done it like that. A long time before that. He didn't have to do what he did, but because he made promises... He wanted to keep them because he told his prophets to say this. He wanted to make sure that he fulfilled those prophecies so that his people could understand what was coming. A 
lot of his people during that time period didn't quite understand. The Messiah to them was a military conquering figure. He was going to bring back the old way where Israel was a kingdom by themselves. The Jews, the Jewish people would have everything right then and there. There'd be no problem. The Lord would be in front of them again. Awful funny that what he settled on was a spiritual kingdom. Benefit much more than his people. God remembered his mercy and his truth for the house of Israel. Jesus was not only sent to redeem, but to show God's glory to the people of Israel. Could he have made the Messiah come from outside of, his, of the Israeli people? The Jewish people? Oh yeah, he could have. He brought him up from within them to bring glory to his people because he said it would happen. It was through his people that the scripture was fulfilled. And it was fulfilled first. To the rest of the world, an invitation to become a child of God was given. The rest of the world did not have the proper background to be a child of God at that, up to that point. By accepting his offer of salvation and redemption, those Gentiles and the barbarians, meaning us, were afforded the opportunity to be one of his children. We don't like to think too often about the fact that we were the outsiders. But we were. The Romans worship so many different gods the Greeks were the same way we won't even talk about the uh, Germanic tribes and uh, the um, people that were in the English what we call England today Picts and I can't remember what the others are but uh, they were they worshiped gods they worshiped might they worship power. A lot of it was whoever was the most powerful that could beat the most heads in ruled. Far cry from what we are now. And I truly believe a lot of it has come down from the fact that God took and made the offer for us to become children of God. And during the time period from when Christ died to now, there has been so much expansion that it changed the way others have looked at leadership, others have looked at how we should be ruled up until the late 1800s, early 1900s, Europe was feudal. King Fernando 
the assassination started World War II or World War I. We had French kings and uh, marrying uh, um, English uh, princes. German, Denmark had their kings. The whole area over there was small groups of people interrelated because this person married this person not because of love but because they were able to make a compromise between two nations two city nations basically the United States what are we? well at the beginning there was 13 states individual banded together and slowly but surely we recognized other parts and created other states within the areas that we were expanding into we had a little bit of a problem some of them said we have the ability to dissolve what we join now I know civil war they talk about slavery they talk about um, state rights I don't know which one it was but I think it was a little bit of both but I came, it came down to you don't have the ability to dissolve this now it's too late I think the slavery issue was an afterthought. That's just my opinion. You know, now saying, you know, and I, I'm fully against slavery. You know, that, that was the a terrible time. You know, it still happens today. Slavery is not over. We have young gentlemen and children in Pakistan acting as slaves making clothing I would say in Africa some of those miners uh, that are in the big mines they're not making hardly anything it's just a different form of slavery in our own history here in West Virginia we had coal companies come in miners would go into the coal companies they'd be charged more for the products than they were making so they had to work extra hard to even have a chance to make it out of there but that's not slavery you know we need to we'll rethink our definition of slavery it's economic slavery God truth and his mercy mercy he showed on the house of Israel Jesus was not only sent to redeem but to show God's glory to the people of Israel There was these people whose scripture was fulfilled first. There was the rest of the world, but the invitation to become a child of God was extended. Now, here's where we could spend the next four hours talking about salvation and redemption. All the things that make up all of that. Why did God do it this way? Why did he not do it that way? We're not going to do that. As uh, I'm seeing, it's getting pretty close to eight. Um, redemption ends not with our accepting salvation, but with the judgment by the Lord and his kingdom reigning forever. 
It's not what we're doing here now. It's that long run where when Revelation comes around and he decides time's done, it's time to make that ju uh, judge everybody, that's when redemption ends. That's when our story is over. When he judges, we're passed over because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. When there's a thousand year reign, his kingdom comes, and all of that. One day we'll understand the full story of redemption. All of its mysteries will be revealed. On that day we'll create and sing a new song to God about his love for mankind. Isaac Watts wrote a song that said it all. We tend to find it in use mostly during Christmas, but it said, the Messiah comes, this is what's going to happen. When everything is done and over with, and his reign has started, we're still going to be singing. That's what he was looking at. And that's really what Psalms 98 is all about. Our understanding that God's big picture has been throughout history. And the second part of that, some of it's still yet to come. I'd say it's time to sing a few more songs, but it's not, so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and thank Him for the opportunity to sing new songs at a later date. Lord, we come before You. We are thankful for all the many works of Your hands that have uh, brought us salvation and redemption. We are thankful for all the things that you've done in preparing salvation and redemption for us. All the things that you've done in keeping it out there so that when the Jewish folk back when Jesus died they, they were able to accept the message and travel on and bring it to the rest of the world we just thank you and offer new songs as we create them for your redemption and your grace. Lord, let us not forget what you've done and help us with a, get a deeper understanding as life goes on. And one day, we'll stand before you with Jesus interceding on our behalf and we'll fully understand everything you've done and why you've done it. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.